Well, we turn now to what I consider to be a Copernican revolution in philosophy. Uh, if you remember back to the beginning of the semester when we looked at the early Greek philosophers, uh, I argued that those philosophers were primarily talking about metaphysical questions, uh, but they were trying to build a whole system of philosophy. Uh, so if they wanted to discover metaphysical realities using reason, uh, they would start there, but they didn't want to end there. Uh, so you're building sort of a foundation up to more practical questions, such as questions of ethics. Uh, but you start with metaphysics in early Greek thought, uh, questions like what is the nature of reality. Once you've established an answer to that question, then you can move on to the question of epistemology, uh, which is, again, the study of knowledge. Uh, so the big question in epistemology is how do we know the things that we claim that we know? Once you've established metaphysics, your metaphysical perspective on reality, that is, you can then ask that question of epistemology. And then, once you have discovered a method for how we know the things that we ought to know, then you can talk about the questions of ethics, such as what is the good life. Uh, so the, the early Greek philosophers were trying to build a philosophy this way, from the bottom up. The sophists come along, and if you remember, they argued that no such metaphysical truths exist. Uh, all of the earlier philosophers were disagreeing with each other about the basic fundamental question, and so the sophists came to the conclusion, therefore there are no answers to the big metaphysical questions. Uh, the problem with that, as Socrates pointed out, is that if you say there are no answers to these big questions, that's just another way of asserting an answer. Um, you know that there are no answers, or you know that there is no truth, and Socrates's question is, well, is that true? Uh, the skeptics who come after the sophists recognize the problem uh, that the sophists have at this point. And so the skeptics uh, wanted to suspend belief rather than to proclaim that there is no truth. Uh, so the skeptics never come along and say there are no metaphysical truths. Rather, all they're doing is saying, I don't know the answer. Uh, and I'm not convinced that you know the answer. I'm not stating that you don't. I'm just con stating my own ignorance. It's a suspension of belief. Um, and after the skeptics, uh, you have Augustine, who really wanted to save us from skepticism. And he maintained that what all of this history points out is that all of knowledge actually begins with faith. Um, specifically, you have to have faith in your metaphysical convictions because reason doesn't get us there. But once you start with the correct faith, and for Augustine, his faith was the faith in uh, a Christian philosophical view of life. Uh, once you start with those faith commitments, then you can build upon that. You can have an epistemology, um, you can develop uh, an ethical system, and that's how you build a philosophical worldview. Uh, so what is the Copernican revolution that happens at this point? Uh, well, the Copernican revolution is this. If early ancient philosophy begins with metaphysics or puts metaphysics at the center of all of philosophy, the shift now is to actually put epistemology at the center um, of everything or to make epistemology the foundation of everything. Um, and so there's a shift that happens. Now, this isn't to say that philosophers after this period, so we're going to be looking at the rationalist philosophers and the empiricists in our next lecture, it's not to say that they don't put, place a huge emphasis on metaphysics. Some of them do. Um, but there is this shift to say that we need to start with epistemology in order to develop our metaphysics, in order to talk about science, ethics, or anything else. Um, and furthermore, we can talk about epistemology before we dive into metaphysical speculations. And so that's the shift that happens. And this shift uh, happens uh, very specifically in the first rationalist philosopher that we'll look at, Rene Descartes. Uh, but before we dive into Descartes, um, I think it's uh, important to get maybe a little more of an introduction to what epistemology is. Uh, so I've already uh, said that epistemology comes from um, the Greek word episteme, which means knowledge. Um, so it's the study of knowledge. Uh, well, if we give just a traditional understanding of what knowledge is in philosophy, now there's certainly debates over this. I'm just going to give you uh, the basic introduction to how philosophers have defined knowledge. Uh, 
Um, oftentimes, knowledge refers to what's called justified true belief. And justified true belief is at least a starting point for understanding the study of knowledge. Uh, so to say that you know something, you at least have to say that you believe it. But of course, believing something is not the same thing as knowing something. Uh, so we might say that belief is one ingredient to having knowledge, but of course you can believe something and if it's not true, then you can't say that you know it. Uh, to know something includes a second ingredient. And the second ingredient is that your belief must also be true. So if you believe something and it's true, you have at least two important ingredients uh, to saying, being able to claim that you have knowledge, but that's not enough. Um, to believe something and to have it be true, at that point you just have true belief. Uh, to be able to have knowledge, you at least have to have belief, that belief has to be true, and you need to have a justification for why you believe in what you believe. And it has to be a good justification. Uh, so if I believe that it's two o'clock right now, and I don't have a watch on, but let's say I had a watch on and my watch is generally reliable, um, and I say I believe that it's two o'clock, and let's say that it's true that it's two o'clock, um, well, I have a true belief at this point. Uh, well, why do you believe that it's two o'clock? Well, if I look at my watch, my watch is generally reliable, and so if we assume that my watch is reliable, I look at my watch, it says it's two o'clock, that's my reason, that's my justification. I believe that it's two o'clock because my watch says it's two o'clock, it actually is two o'clock, so it's true, um, and therefore I have all the ingredients for knowledge, therefore I can say I know that it's two o'clock. So to have knowledge, you have to have justified true belief. That's just uh, the basis of, of having uh, formed an epistemology. Well, now there is this question in epistemology of what counts for justification. And at this point in philosophy that we're going to be looking at, there are two schools of thought. There is the rationalist school of thought that argues that to have justification, you need to have a rational deductive argument for the things that you claim to be true. Um, so you can believe it, it can be true, but you also have to have a rational deductive. Um, in other words, the, the rationalist will say, if you wanna know what's true or have good reasons for believing things, you need to sit and think about it for a while. You need to reflect on it um, and have careful logical reflection. The empiricists, on the other hand, represent another school of thought, and they say if you want justification for the things that you say that you believe, you need to go out and see. You need empirical evidence, tangible, you use your five senses, and if you can see it, that counts as justification for the things that you say are true. Um, so two schools of thought. For this lecture, we're gonna be looking at the rationalist school of thought, and specifically, we're gonna be looking at three key thinkers. Rene Descartes, Baruch Spinoza, and Gottfried Leibniz. Um, so let's start with Descartes. Uh, so Descartes is oftentimes considered uh, the father of rationalism, um, although I think the rationalist approach to knowledge goes all the way back to Plato. Um, remember um, the famous uh, quote by Alfred North Whitehead, um, the history of philosophy is just a footnote of Plato. Um, I think there's some truth to that because when you get to Descartes, um, his philosophy in some ways uh, resembles Plato's philosophy, um, although uh, Descartes is beginning with epistemology uh, or the existence of the subjective knower um, before he starts talking about metaphysics. And so this re represents uh, Descartes' philosophy really well in his uh, Meditations on First Philosophy. Uh, so Descartes writes, It is now some years since I detected how many are the false beliefs that I had from my earliest youth admitted as true, and how doubtful was everything I had since constructed on this basis. And from that time I was convinced that I must once for all seriously undertake to rid myself of all the opinions which I formally accepted and commenced to build anew from the foundation. Uh, so Descartes is trying to come up with a method uh, 
for which he could have certain knowledge for the things that he believes to be true. Um, so he wants to start with a new foundation. Um, and so he is a foundationalist when it comes to epistemology, meaning that you start with foundational truths and then you try to build a system of epistemology on top of those foundational truths. Uh, so how does Descartes do this? Well, Descartes develops a, a method of doubt. So he says, you should doubt whatever can be doubted, for if it can be doubted, then it cannot be certain. Uh, so if you can doubt something, just logically speaking, if you can doubt something, then what follows is that you don't have absolute 100% certainty for that thing. Uh, so what types of things can be doubted? Uh, he says, well, my senses can be doubted. Uh, there are times where I know that my senses have deceived me. Um, if you ever traveled on a very hot day and you've been on a highway, um, you can see a mirage in the road where it looks like there's water going across the road, um, but really it's your senses deceiving you. Um, you can doubt your senses in even a more fundamental way, um, such as you can doubt whether or not the external world around you is even real. Uh, because you're perceiving right now, well, if you're listening to this lecture, you're perceiving me on your computer screen. And so you might think that I'm a real person. Uh, you might think that the world around you, the room that you're sitting in right now, is a real physical room, but you don't know whether or not you're dreaming right now, or if your whole life has been a dream, or you don't know whether or not you, you might be in a computer simulation right now. Um, perhaps you're a part of the matrix. Um, so this external world around you can be doubted. Now you might think, but I'm pretty sure this world is real. But are you 100% sure? Um, if you're not 100% sure, then Descartes says you can doubt it. And so you can doubt whether or not this external world around you is real. Um, you can doubt the existence of God. So religious beliefs can be doubted. Um, you can doubt whether or not your moral values are correct or whether any moral values are correct. But Descartes says, when you go through this system of doubting, there is one thing that can't be doubted. And that is that I am doubting. Now, if you ask the question, what follows from this? Well, what follows from this is therefore I must exist, according to Descartes. Uh, so the famous phrase is dubito ergo sum, I doubt, therefore I exist, or as you might be more familiar with, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Uh, so if it's the case that I'm able to do this thought experiment of doubting everything, well, there's one thing that I can't doubt, no matter how hard I try, says Descartes, and that is that I'm actually doubting right now. So doubting is happening, and if doubting's happening, well, someone has to be there to be doing the doubting, and that someone must be me. And so his foundational conviction is what might be called an indubitable truth. So it's a truth that's so certain that it cannot be doubted. And Descartes wants to build um, a philosophical system from these indubitable truths. Um, now, what are these indubitable truths? Uh, well, truths of mathematics, Descartes a mathematician, um, but even these self-evident truths such as um, I exist. Now, Descartes moves from this method of epistemology, this foundationless method of epistemology, to some interesting conclusions. Um, specifically, he has conclusions about uh, the mind-body problem in philosophy. Uh, so this problem in philosophy is really a problem of um, how do you know what the human person is made of? Um, can the human person be reduced to uh, one physical, biological thing, your, your body? Um, can you be reduced to your brain? Um, so are all of your thoughts, emotions, uh, fears, hopes, dreams, are they just reduced to chemical synapses going on in your brain? Or is there an extra part of you that you might call the mind or the soul, this extra part of you that exists independent from your body? Uh, well, Descartes says there is an extra part of you. Um, and he argues that this is also self-evident. Uh, because if you ask the question, how do I know that my brain exists using this epistemology? Well, Descartes says the best we can do is provide indirect evidence for the existence of my brain. Uh, so I can say, I believe that my brain exists, but 
in order for that indirect evidence to be sound, I have to trace it back to an indubitable truth, um, namely truths like I think therefore I am or mathematical deduction. Um, those would be indubitable truths. But when it comes to my mind, how do I know that my mind exists? Descartes says that's just a self-evident truth. You have direct evidence of your mind because if you didn't, you wouldn't be thinking right now. And so Descartes says it's 100% certain that I have a mind. And once you start with the fact that I have a mind, then you can try to develop secondary evidence for whether or not you have a brain. Um, so Descartes says it's more sure that I have a mind than that I have a brain. Um, and so that is Descartes' mind-body dualism. Uh, but now there is a big question. So after he establishes the existence of the self, well, how then can we know anything else? Uh, Descartes has an answer to this. Uh, Descartes actually offers a version of the ontological argument to justify uh, the reliability of our senses. Um, so one of the reasons why I think he likes the ontological argument is because the ontological argument, as presented by Anselm, is an a priori argument or a deductive argument, meaning you don't need to have any uh, evidence, empirical evidence of the world to be able to understand the ontological argument. It's a purely sit down and think rationalistic argument. And Descartes a mathematician. He likes those types of arguments. And so he argues that God must be uh, the necessary reality that just exists. Um, and if you ask well, what makes God have um, perfect moral attributes, Descartes says, well, let's assume that God is morally perfect. And if God is morally perfect, and I'm created, say, in the image of this God, then I can trust that my senses correspond to the real world. Why? Because if God is morally perfect, God would not try to deceive me. And so the world that I see around me, this external world, I can trust that this external world is real because God is not trying to deceive me. But, Descartes goes on to say, if God were an evil demon and God was constantly trying to trick us, then I would have no way to know whether my senses are reliable. And so the, the version of the ontological argument that Descartes tries to construct is one where God is morally perfect because that gives us reliability in our sense experiences and therefore we can know things outside of these indubitable truths. Um, and this God can't be an evil demon, otherwise we would have no, um, no assurance at all that our senses are true. And so this is the system that Descartes is trying to construct. After Descartes, you have a Baruch Spinoza, um, who's similar to Descartes in that he's still a rationalist, uh, but his philosophy is much more complicated. Um, he tries to develop a whole uh, geometry of philosophy, um, arguing that there's about 250 axioms, that once you start with those axioms, you can actually explain all of reality deductively. Um, and so this is Spinoza's approach to, to knowledge. Um, he further argued that the existence of God is more obvious than the self. Uh, so this is one area where he's different than Descartes. Um, Descartes argues that the existence of God can be doubted, uh, but the existence of self cannot be doubted, logically speaking. Spinoza is just the opposite. Uh, Spinoza is a Jewish philosopher who argues that the existence of God is actually far more obvious than the existence of the self. And once you start with the self-existent reality of God, uh, then you can learn more about uh, the world around us and there you can develop a system of philosophy from there. Um, and furthermore, when, when Spinoza is talking about God, uh, he has a pantheistic view, um, which simply means all is God. So the whole cosmos is actually God for Spinoza. So we are observing the existence of God as we're looking around uh, the room right now. Um, and philosophy for him actually begins with uh, the problem of nature. So you have to understand what the nature of reality is and the existence of God. And once you start there, then you can um, develop the rest of your philosophy. Uh, so Spinoza is what you would call a monist. We've talked about this earlier, uh, but a monist is just somebody that believes that there's one basic thing. 
Uh, so everything is God or everything is nature. Um, and you can actually use those words interchangeably in uh, Spinoza's um, thought. Um, but even though he's a monist, he does still argue that there are two aspects of nature. Um, so he calls these different aspects um, nature nurturing, uh, which refers to active causation uh, versus nature nurture, nurtured, which refers to passive causation. Um, so there are two modes of causation in Spinoza's thought. Um, and the way that I like to think about these two modes of causation is the distinction between what we might call agent causation versus necessary causation. Uh, so when we're talking about agent causation, um, just one simple way to think about agent causation is to think about yourself, um, to think about the choices that you make. Um, so let's say I right now choose to raise my hand in the air. So I make the choice for my hand to go up. Um, and if you were to ask, well, why did your hand go up there? Why did that physical event just happen? Uh, well, one simple explanation is that I, as an agent, decided to raise my hand. Um, so there is a me inside of my body who makes choices as an agent. And so agents can cause things to happen. Um, so you can think of that as active uh, causation. Uh, where if you talk about necessary causation, um, such as, say, my heart is beating right now. Uh, well, why is my heart beating? Well, it's not because I'm actively making choices for my heart to beat right now. I mean, you could say my, my brain is doing that work. Um, but there, it's not a choice in the same way that I choose to raise my hand or um, choose to put my hand down. I can't just make choices in the same way when it comes to other parts of my body. And so you could say that my heart beating is just operating according to basic laws of biology. Um, and, and so it's more of a passive causation that's happening. Um, well, you can take those two modes of causation and you can extend that out to all of reality. Um, so there are some physical events that happen according to physical cause and effect. Um, and when you have physical cause and effect relationships or when you're talking about physical cause and effect relationships, you're talking about necessary causation. Um, there's some sort of physical law that can describe or make sense out of why a particular thing happened. Whereas when you're talking about agent causation, I mean, this is a big question in philosophy and for Spinoza, it's, it's a huge question. Why is there um, motion anywhere in the cosmos? I mean, this question goes all the way back to, um, I mean, arguably the early pre-Socratic philosophers, Aristotle certainly was um, a big focus of his philosophy. Uh, well, Spinoza says things happen because of agent causation where God is actively causing things to happen. Um, and there are things that just happen according to laws that are set up. Um, so if you think about a creation um, or the, the natural world around us, um, according to God is actively making things happen, that's agent causation versus God creates a system where some things just run automatically, that would be necessary causation. Um, and so that's the distinction that Spinoza brings up when he's talking about um, the two different types of causation, nature nurturing versus nature nurtured. The next philosopher is Gottfried Leibniz. And Leibniz, again, is a rationalist. Um, and he argues that everything that we observe is divisible into smaller parts. And he rejects uh, atomism. So when you initially hear that everything is divisible into smaller parts, you might think, oh, he's an atomist. Um, but actually he rejects atomism because um, the typical way of thinking about atoms is that atoms are small, lifeless particles of matter. And Leibniz wants to reject that idea because uh, a lifeless particle of matter can't do anything. Um, if you just broke everything down to small little bits of impersonal, um, motionless matter, how would you ever get motion? And so instead of being an atomist, uh, he says that everything reduces to what he calls monads, uh, which are non-three-dimensional forces or, or energy. Um, so he's, he's not a materialist in the sense that everything reduces to matter. Um, a monad is is capable of action, but it's completely immaterial. 
Um, there's no physical reality to it. It's kind of like a soul or a mind. And that actually explains all the motion that we see in the cosmos. Um, and furthermore, Leibniz believes that every monad behaves according to its created purpose. And that's why the world is orderly. That's why the world makes sense. Um, and so you might guess that Leibniz is also a theistic type philosopher. Uh, so he develops, um, probably his most famous idea is the principle of sufficient reason, uh, where he's making an argument for the existence of God um, through his understanding of monads. Uh, but he says that uh, nothing happens without a sufficient reason. That's basically the principle of sufficient reason. Uh, so if you see, say, a small crystal ball laying in a desert somewhere, you don't just assume that that crystal ball got there accidentally. Um, that would not be a good explanation. Um, small objects need an explanation because nothing happens just without a cause or without a sufficient reason, that is. Uh, well, if this is true for small objects, Leibniz would ask, why would a larger object, like say the universe, be an exception to this rule? If small objects need an explanation, then presumably the whole universe as a whole needs an explanation. And this is true for Leibniz, even when we're talking about an eternal universe. Um, so if we were to assume that the universe has just always been here for all of eternity, um, there was no beginning to the universe and there's no end to the universe, uh, if we made that assumption, even in that case, Leibniz would say the universe is contingent. Um, so he makes a big deal out of this distinction between um, contingent beings or contingent truths and necessary truths. Um, so something that's contingent, uh, we've talked about this earlier, but a contingent thing is something that doesn't have to be the case. Um, so if you can do a thought exper experiment um, imagining something out of existence, then whatever it is you're talking about is contingent. And so when it comes to a universe, even if it's eternal, you could imagine that there would be no eternal universe. And if you can imagine it, then that means that the universe must be eternal or contingent, even if it um, happens to be eternal. And so Leibniz says the universe is contingent, which makes the biggest, most important philosophical question for Leibniz, um, and arguably one of the most important questions in philosophy, which is why is there something rather than nothing? And Leibniz's answer to this question is that there's something rather than nothing because God exists and God is the necessary reality that holds the universe into, ex into existence. Um, so you can't rationally imagine God not existing according to Leibniz and therefore God just is. Um, and everything that happens furthermore according to Leibniz is happening because of God's will and decree. Uh, well, this brings up a big question um, and the question is, well, if God wills absolutely everything, and if God is the necessary reality that causes every contingent reality to happen, then what do you do with evil? Um, why is it that there's suffering in this world and pain in this world if God is causing everything to happen? And Leibniz develops what's called a theodicy, um, an attempt to sort of get God off the hook for evil by arguing that this is actually the best of all possible worlds. Um, now, how could Leibniz argue this? Well, he has this illustration of a painting uh, to help you understand what he means by the best of all possible worlds. Uh, he writes, if you look at a very beautiful picture, but you cover up the whole of it, except for a very small part, what will it present to your sight, however thoroughly you examine it, but a confused mass of colors laid on without selection and without art. Yet, he goes on to say, if you remove the covering and you look at the picture from the right point of view, you will find that what appeared to have been carelessly spattered on the canvas was really done by the painter and with very great art. Uh, so what is Leibniz saying? Well, let's just take a picture and imagine what he's saying. Uh, he says, if you look at a picture, say the picture that you see on your screen right now, and you ask, is this one of the most beautiful paintings that you've ever seen? Uh, you might say, 
it's okay. It's kind of dark, um, but I, I can't say it's one of the most beautiful paintings that I've ever seen. I can't say that it's um, even all that impressive because um, all you see is just a few dark squiggly lines. Um, it could be better. I've seen better. But that, of course, is just looking at a very, very small section of the painting. And when you zoom out, you see how that very small part that's not initially impressive fits into the whole painting. And when you observe the whole painting, it's actually beautiful. Well, this is an illustration that uh, Leibniz uses to talk about um, every event that happens in history. Um, so are there events that are um, painful, suffering, and maybe even in themselves evil? Well, the answer is yes, according to Leibniz. But does that mean the whole painting is evil? And he says no, because when you can step back and look at the whole painting, all of reality from beginning to end, you will see that this painting was constructed in such a way that it's the best of all possible paintings. And yes, if you just look at one small section, um, a small section of your life where there's pain and suffering, or uh, horrible atrocities that go on in the world. Yes, those sections are bad when you only look at those sections, but as humans, we're finite, and we can only see those small sections. And so he says what you need to be able to do, which we're not capable of doing, is have God's perspective on it. And from God's perspective, the whole painting is beautiful, and that's how God can control everything, and yet, at the same time, evil uh, might occur, because the evil is just a small part of the painting. Uh, so those are our three rationalist thinkers, Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz. Uh, for our next lecture, we'll look at the empiric empiricist thinkers um, who present an alternative epistemology um, to the rationalists.